On the 22nd of October, the 16th BRICS summit was convened in the Russian city of Kazan that was attended by delegations from across the world. BRICS is an economic forum originally consisting of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa and is becoming an influential force in an increasingly multipolar global order. The summit concluded with the admission of a host of new countries as members, including Egypt, Iran, the United Arab Emirates and Ethiopia. One of the countries whose delegation was present at the summit was Afghanistan. Whilst its government remains officially unrecognized and it was not made a member of the new alliance, its attendance marks a significant development in the country's foreign relations. In this episode, we will be discussing the importance of this development and Afghanistan's evolving role in a rapidly changing world. Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Welcome to another episode of the Afghan Eye podcast. I'm your host Sangar Paikar and I'm joined by my co-host Ahmed Walid Kakar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. First of all, Ahmad Walid, how are you doing? And it's been a while. What have you been up to lately? It has been a while. So late, I'm not sure about lately, but over the past couple of months, we've obviously been somewhat inactive and very busy. So I got engaged, tra- went to Afghanistan again this year, but then I had to cut my trip short because my grandmother, Saidi Obakhshi, passed away whilst I was in Afghanistan so yeah it's and then since then I've just sort of been getting back into the flow of life so we're back and it's another episode for the Afghan Eye podcast yeah may Allah grant her paradise and I hope that you and your family have the patience you know bereavement is a very difficult uh, matter and I also congratulate you with your engagement. Yes. Thank so you. let's you. focus on this Kaza Summit. Before we dive into this topic, I would like to read an excerpt of the declaration in conclusion of this summit that specifically mentions Afghanistan. So the declaration states, we emphasize the need for an urgent peaceful settlement in Afghanistan in order to strengthen regional security and stability. We advocate for Afghanistan as an independent, united and peaceful state free from terrorism, war and drugs. We urge for more visible and verifiable measures in Afghanistan to ensure that the territory of Afghanistan is not used by terrorists. We stress the need to provide urgent, uninterrupted humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people and to safeguard the fundamental rights of all Afghans, including women, girls and different ethnic groups. We call on Afghanistan authorities to reverse the effective ban on girls' secondary and higher education. We emphasize the primary and effective role of regional platforms and neighboring countries of Afghanistan and welcome the efforts of such regional platforms and initiatives to facilitate Afghan settlement. Quite a detailed mentioning of Afghanistan. Uh, We will dive into... No stone left unturned. Exactly. We will dive into that but first of all, I would like to pose a question to you. So with BRICS recent expansion to 13 new partner nations and its uh, positioning as a multipolar force, how do you assess Afghanistan's interest in joining BRICS and what strategic benefits could it bring? I think there are a couple of things here. Um, 
Afghanistan's interest in joining BRICS is something that's hardly surprising. Afghanistan since 2021 has been in a state of isolation politically, economically, especially with the imposition of sanctions from the Western world that have made low, you know, banking in the country exceptionally difficult. And if banking is difficult, financial transactions become difficult. It really sort of hampers the effectiveness with which trade and commerce can go forth. So Afghanistan's interest in joining BRICS, particularly if you look at the profile of the countries in BRICS, you mentioned Russia, India, China. These are all countries where even if they don't border Afghanistan, I mean, unless you're of the opinion that all of Kashmir is part of India, then Afghanistan and India do border each other. But obviously there is, depending on your persuasion, there's Pakistan occupied Kashmir or there is Azad Kashmir, right? So Afghanistan, you know, that's a separate issue. But these are countries in the Afghan neighborhood. So Afghanistan's interest in joining them would be undeniable insofar as it would facilitate the means for Afghanistan to circumvent some of the sanctions placed on it and to greater integrate itself in regional trade. And there obviously would be a political benefit as well to be with and to seem to be with some of these countries would contribute to a greater normalization of the current Afghan government, which is led by the Taliban, who are looking to become sort of more acceptable and mainstream at a global level. That acceptability and that normalization has not been forthcoming from the West, despite, you know, you could say repeated overtures. How underpinned those overtures have been by substantive action is a separate topic, but uh, there are quite a few benefits here. But there would obviously be questions to be asked with respect to how aligned BRICS's mission and its goals would be with that of Afghanistan's. All right. With, okay. So BRICS aims to promote a more balanced international order, especially for nations marginalized by Western dominance. Given Afghanistan's challenges, how aligned is BRICS mission with Afghanistan's needs? I think we need to be somewhat we need to take a step back and be more scrutinizing here. So, and we need to sort of read the room, if you will. So what is the context of this summit? This summit is taking place, if we just move out of Afghanistan for a second and we analyze what's happening worldwide, we first of all have an ongoing Israeli massacre in Gaza and the ripple effects of that, not just in the West where you've got protests and campus activism and things of the sort, but in terms of how discredited increasingly the US specifically is becoming in what we can call the global South. In addition to that, you have the ongoing war in Ukraine in which Russia is obviously an active belligerent and it is in Russia that this summit has, been to, has taken place. So that's the broader context, right? Now, we mentioned Western dominance and being marginalized by Western dominance. First and foremost in that would come Afghanistan, which was occupied by a Western bloc for 20 years. But just because a country presents itself as being anti-Western, or you have a host of countries who have an active interest in combating Western hegemony, it doesn't necessarily translate into their being in agreement on all issues. Now, if we look at some of the countries in BRICS, so you mentioned Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now, India and China, in many regards, don't really see eye to eye with, with one another. And in fact, India, with regard to concerns as to its record of minorities and uh, especially with regard to the far-right Hindu government. Uh, well, not so far-right anymore given the recent elections, but in any case, the position that Pr Prime Minister Modi's party has occupied in government since 2014, India has had all those concerns essentially overlooked by Washington, D.C., especially under the Biden administration, because the Biden administration wants to prop up 
and helped India as a counterbalance to China. Now, that's one key factor that we need to look at here. India and China don't necessarily see eye to eye on many things. Both of them occupy bits of Kashmir, which is disputed, the third party being Pakistan. And India also enjoys friendly relations with the leader of the free Western world, the United States. Then you have, we mentioned, you mentioned that some of the newer countries that have joined as partners or members of BRICS, Egypt and Ethiopia, who don't necessarily see eye to eye with each other. One of the reasons for which is the waters of the River Nile, right? Then you have the country like the United Arab Emirates joining BRICS. Now, it's undeniable that the UAE and the Gulf monarchies have become more assertive over the past years, and they're more willing to openly defy, let's say, the interests of Washington, D.C. We've seen recently the Gulf monarchies, including the UAE, have communicated very clearly that they'd be neutral in the instance of any hostilities between Iran and Israel. Uh, they've even denied use of their airspace to American and Israeli aircraft in the instance that they wanted to attack or launch any aerial attacks on Iran. But can we call the UAE anti-Western? Once again, we're not saying that the... We, I don't want to be simplistic here and say there are puppets of the West and there are opponents of the West, but there is a grey area here, right? So based on all of the above, can we really say that BRICS is a tenable alliance based on all of the tensions that are endemic and inherent to it and if we cannot guarantee its tenability or its viability as a bloc how then can we argue that it would be suited to Afghanistan or that Afghanistan would be suited to it as you mentioned India and China may not see eye to eye and I agree that both nations have their historical issues with one another, but India and China have pulled back their troops from the border region where there were tensions in the Himalayan mountains. And there was an article in The Economist, basically the report suggests that the BRICS summit was a event where India, China have more or less agreed to end their tensions and hostilities. And some analysts even argue that the new relationship between the Indian leader Narendra Modi and the Chinese leader uh, Xi Jinping uh, may be the opening of a new phase between the two powers in Asia that could lead to a more stable relationship between the two nations, but it may also even impact the balance between different members of BRICS. So let's just assume that these recent developments between China and uh, India may be substantial. Uh, how would that impact the role of BRICS as a organization, especially in Asia? Because as a country, Afghanistan, we are more or less reliant on what goes around in the neighborhood, whether it's China and India or Pakistan and uh, India, or maybe Russia involved in any other conflict. So let's just assume that these reports about improving ties between China and India are true. How would that impact the situation? Are we talking about the situation with respect to Afghanistan specifically or more broadly? For more Brits broadly, well? because you mentioned that we should be more skeptical. I mean, this is, the skeptical. Thing, right? this, is, this is the thing, right? It's that BRICS is undeniably a force on the global stage, right? And the two sort of horsemen of BRICS, if you will, even though... Russia is there as well, India and China just by virtue of their populations. So because, you know, you've got two and a half, three, maybe two and a half billion, let's say, a third of the world's population in those two countries, obviously, whatever affects those two countries is going to be first front and center in everyone's perspective. But it wouldn't really change. And if we go back to our podcast where we spoke about John Jay uh, Mersheimer's book, The Great Delusion, Mersheimer 
addresses the fact that liberal democracies tend to get a, along with each other very well, especially in the post-World War II order, right? The same cannot really, and he dissects the argument, but overall it is it does tend to be a reality, especially because of the economic interdependence in the Western bloc. The same thing doesn't really exist in BRICS. Now, India and China is one example. One of the countries to join is Iran. Iran and Russia are aligned on various issues, but in Syria, they also often have their differences. Kazakhstan has also been, let's say, promoted in the BRICS alliance, but it has openly defied Russia in recent years with regard to Ukraine. So India and China, as far as the economic the Economist article goes, there may be a new phase in relations. Maybe, right? But what is demonstrably the case is that Washington, D.C., perhaps not uncharacteristically, is willing to overlook the concerns of its human rights record in order that it becomes a counterbalance to China, right? It wouldn't be the first time that Washington, D.C. does that because, you know, unless you're blind and deaf, the same thing is happening with regard to Israel as well, right? So India and China, yeah, may, it may happen. But once again, and finally, we go back to the excerpt of the declaration that you read right at the beginning of the podcast. You've got an anti-Western bloc criticizing and drawing attention to the shortcomings, real or alleged, of probably one of the foremost anti-Western countries in the world, Afghanistan, which has put those anti-Western credentials to, it has pr it's put them to use in battle for, for in the course of fighting an occupation over 20 years, right? So just being an anti-Western alliance doesn't guarantee that there'll be sort of harmony and unity in, for, forget all issues on even the most key and critical issues. Okay, fair enough. So BRICS summit was concluded by a press conference by Putin, where he mentioned collaboration with the Global South specifically. Uh, many countries uh, in BRICS support greater autonomy for from Western financial and political structures. Afghanistan is impacted by Western financial and political structures, like, for example, under current situation, even sending aid money to Afghanistan is not easy. There are restrictions like the banking system is restricted. Aid money through banking system cannot be, you know, transferred to Afghanistan easily. And likewise, if anybody wants to invest in Afghanistan, for example, let's say someone from UK or the Netherlands, they can't just, you know, wire money to Afghanistan and invest in Afghan mines and infrastructure or real estate. So if BRICS and the members of BRICS or the partners of BRICS support, you know, more autonomy from Western financial and political structures, how could Afghanistan benefit from this collective push? Well, I guess you could say if... If such a thing were to reach fruition and were to really materialize, it would lead to Afghanistan, on the one hand, you could say being unshackled, because the reason for the imposition of all of these restrictions and sanctions emanates from the political. And as you said, the banking system, as we know it, the world financial system, as we know it today, is one that's not just the brainchild of the West, but whose remote control remains in Western hands. And the reason for the weaponization of that financial system stems from the political, which in Afghanistan's instance, relates to reservations policymakers in Western capitals may have with regard to the philosophical outlook or the ideology that is exhibited and to which the Taliban as a government are beholden. So if and where, and I at the end of the conference as well, I think Putin gave a speech where he spoke about how this new alliance and this new bloc would not seek to impose any ideological conditions or any political conditions on economic cooperation, if such a thing were to, and I have my reservations about that statement as well, by the way, and 
perhaps we can get into it. But if hypothetically such a thing were to emerge, then yeah, Afghanistan would be unshackled financially because then you would have a relatively freer flow of capital, especially from a giant like China, which is increasingly investing in the global south or depending on where which terminology you use, third world countries, that freer flow of financial capital would obviously benefit Afghanistan, especially being at the center of BRICS countries like India, like Iran, like China and Russia. If we look at the current economic and you know financial relationships of the current government in Afghanistan with the neighboring countries, we see a major development project for construction of a railway from Uzbekistan through northern and central and eastern Afghanistan into Pakistan. And this is facilitated by Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. They are the new partner nations of BRICS. And at the same time, we see that there is a road being built in the Wakhan corridor that will connect Afghanistan directly with its neighbor, China, that will facilitate commerce and trade. And we see that Iran has become a member of BRICS and there is a deal between the current government and Iran for the usage of its port. What's the name of the port? Again? Chabahar. Chabahar, yes. And we also heard about a Russian construction company being involved in uh, building a railway in western and southern Afghanistan. So based on these uh, developments in the last three years, we see that with regards to construction and even some commerce, like for example, a trade, we see that there is a lot of activity between Afghanistan, uh, Russia, China, Iran, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, so if we assess this situation as it is right now and the current sanctions and restrictions that are imposed, would you say that a emergent BRICS alliance would have even more of an accelerator's role for development in Afghanistan or you would say maybe, would you be more cautious about this? I would say that as far as trade goes, as long as Afghanistan's relationship with Pakistan remains as tense as it is, I would be very cautious. I would be, if optimistic, I would be very cautiously so. And the reasons for that, multifaceted. Number one is that amongst Afghanistan's neighbours, Pakistan is the largest in terms of, po if we exclude China for a bit, excepting China, Pakistan is Afghanistan's largest neighbor. Were I to be optimistic, I'd be very cautiously so. The reason for that is that for as long as Afghanistan's relationship with Pakistan is as tense as it currently is, then compensating for trade with the other neighbors is not or may not yield the dividends that we would want it to yield. And the reasons for that, quite a few. Number one is, it is true that a road is being built in the Wakhan corridor between Afghanistan and China. However, the question then becomes, how, what is the volume of trade or traffic that one road, or let's say if that road is to be expanded, what is the volume of trade that that road can support? Will it exceed the volume of trade that we could have with Pakistan, which is our largest neighbor, which has 200 million people, and which also has the port of Karachi, right? So if we want to export our goods out to the world, whilst the Chabahar idea is great and it should be developed in many Afghan governments, whether it's the Taliban, whether it's Ashraf Ghani have wanted to develop Chabahar, the reality is, is that Chabahar as a port is not as expansive as Karachi and will not be for at least not just the next coming years, but the coming decades. And trade with Iran cannot, with, with a population of, let's say, 70, 80 million, cannot compete with trade with Pakistan. Neither can trade with the Central Asian republics compete with the trade of Pakistan. So whilst all of these infrastructure projects are great, and like I said, just to contextualize, you've got Afghanistan in the middle of India, China, 
Russia, Kazakhstan, Iran, all BRICS countries, but none of those countries at this moment in time can supplant Pakistan, not even China by virtue of geography. So the growth of infrastructure, of railroads, of roads, of increasing volume of trade and traffic between all of these countries is a positive development and may yield to a blossoming in Afghanistan's fortunes if we're being very optimistic, they still cannot take the place of Pakistan. That's a very good point. The reason why Pakistan is not a member of BRICS or not even a partner uh, is because India is a founding member of the BRICS. So it is being said by a number of analysts from India and from Pakistan, but also from Western research organizations that the chances of Pakistan becoming a prominent member of BRICS is limited as long as its relationship with India is as it is. So now that you said that, you know, even a relationship with BRICS will not improve the Afghan predicament due to its relationship with Pakistan, do you see any like ways to leverage that? Would you say Afghanistan could improve its ties with Iran, China, and the other BRICS partners and nations to somehow, you know, uh, have a leverage over Pakistan so that Pakistan uh, changes its policies and becomes more accommodating towards Afghanistan? Would that be a possibility? I think Pakistan is currently in a very, quite an acute a quagmire so to speak, on numerous levels. There's obviously the fact that Pakistan is and has been for quite a few years now a victim to political instability at home, whether it's coming from constitutional amendments, whether it's coming from judicial reforms or the overthrow of a prime minister. All of these things are obviously affecting its standing in the world. On top of that is the fact that Pakistan, even during the Cold War, was more aligned with the American and the Western camp, whereas India enjoyed closer ties with the Soviet Union, which is why India obviously supported the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and Pakistan, we obviously know, supported the Mujahideen. In recent years, however, partly as a result of the perception in Western capitals that Pakistan is duplicitous, unreliable, perhaps you could say hypocritical according to some, it's fallen out of favor with both the Western camp, especially as a result of the political instability. You're seeing a greater talk in the US Congress with regard to the welfare or the lack thereof of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. India has always been on a, had a very warm relationship with Russia. And in recent times, Indirectly, the rise of China has allowed it to position itself to a Western audience as a counterbalance. So I don't think that there is any chance in the near to medium or in the long term, or perhaps in the long term, yes, but in the near to medium term, Afghanistan and Pakistan's problems are not ones that can be extrapolated towards rival blocs. They are very directly relevant and bilateral, restricted, not just between the two countries, but also regionally between the two countries. They're, they're far more acute than BRICS could possibly allay. And the only circumstance in which Indian reservations about Pakistan joining BRICS could possibly be alleviated is India and Pakistan also coming toward a settlement, which at this moment in time, looks as unlikely as it has ever been. You've mentioned current quagmire where Pakistan is basically in. We also saw a very damning statement by the Chinese diplomats regarding the security situation in Pakistan. And at the same time, we see another very interesting development. Uh, China has granted 100% duty-free access to imports from Afghanistan. And this may have a, a significant impact on the economy in Afghanistan. But how would you assess this decision? And especially the fact that this decision has been announced now, more or less 
coinciding with the BRICS summit. Do you see any relation between the BRICS summit, this announcement, and maybe more or less the relationship of China and Afghanistan improving? How would you assess that? Well, if we refer to the podcast that we did assessing Chinese relationship with the Taliban, if you recall, we also did a newsletter covering the first six months of 2024. And for all intents and purposes, in your introduction, you said that Afghanistan's government remains officially unrecognized. And the key word that we want to highlight and underline and put in bold is officially. Because unofficially, it is recognized foremost by China. The Afghan ambassador to China, Bilal Karimi, was received together with diplomats from 40 other countries by the Chinese head of state. So I wouldn't attribute this so much to the BRICS conference, although it may have played a role, but generally speaking, there seems to be a greater level of understanding in the bilateral relationship between Beijing and Kabul. Uh, one of the new members of BRICS is the United Arab Emirates. And very recently, we also covered this on afghanai.org. The United Arab Emirates has also accepted officially the diplomatic delegation from the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. And the Minister of Interior of Afghanistan, Khalifa Sirajdin of Haqqani, have also visited the UAE. Now, we know that from the beginning of this new era of the Taliban government in Afghanistan, they more or less had contacts with China. We saw many Chinese diplomats, businessmen coming to Afghanistan and basically more or less pretending like uh, Afghanistan is officially recognized and there's nothing wrong with the current government. But it's a very interesting development to see a country that is so closely aligned with the West, United Arab Emirates, accepting not only the diplomatic mission of Afghanistan officially, but also its Minister of Interior Affairs, who is on the FBI wanted list. And now we also see the UAE joining BRICS. I would say this provides a new perspective on not just the relationship of UAE as an actor in the region with the rest of the world, but also how it may open doors for Afghanistan, because Dubai is and remains and has always been a significant access point to Afghanistan, and it has also served as a a way for Afghan businessmen to basically reach the rest of the world. So how does the membership of UAE in BRICS going to impact Afghanistan? Not much. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm sort of dismissive of BRICS. I, I do believe it's a, it's a force that's growing in its importance on the global stage. But as you highlighted, all of these developments between the UAE and Afghanistan, the importance of Dubai as a capital city in exile for Afghan businessmen, if you will, uh, the relationship between the UAE and Afghanistan. These developments did not emerge from the UAE's relationship or membership in BRICS and were happening quite independently of it. The other thing is that the UAE's reasons and motives for developing a relationship with Afghanistan under the Taliban are divorced from the fact that it enjoys friendly relations with the Western world. The UAE has its own motivations, not just for opposing, as it calls it, political Islam, but also at the same time, despite that opposition, having relationship with the Taliban, who was who are political Islam personified. So at this moment in time, BRICS is not a block, let's say, like NATO like the EU, where there's a greater coalescence and convergence of interests that motivates this bloc to largely act and speak as one. Right now, at this moment in time, the relationship between Afghanistan and the individual blocs within BRICS is more on a bilateral basis rather than one between an aspiring member of a bloc and the bloc 
in and of itself. The example would be Turkey trying to join the EU, right? So I think there are enough reasons at an individual or the bilateral relation between all of these different member states, relationships with Afghanistan, even without BRICS being in the equation, which obviously it is and has adds a further level of sort of complexity to what is going on. One of the biggest problems that Afghanistan is currently facing is the fact that there is not enough capital moving into Afghanistan that can facilitate economic uh, growth and development. Like, for example, we know that the mining sector is quite lucrative and interesting for foreign investors. There is a construction sector that is growing. You could also say that people could invest in renewable energy, in agriculture. There was a recently a very big renewable energy project uh, announced that was based in Surubi district of Kabul. This was by an Afghan who is actually based outside Afghanistan. So for any kind of development, you need capital and capital needs to flow into Afghanistan. And because of the sanctions and restrictions, uh, people who do have capital, for example, in Europe, UK, maybe other parts of the world, they will be probably less inclined to invest in Afghanistan under current circumstances. But one of the ways how people can still invest in Afghanistan is by working with the UAE as an intermediary. And this is what we have witnessed in recent, like in la last few years, we see that that is being done quite frequently. What we also see, for example, is that Russian fossil fuels are being sold to Europe via India. So there are all kinds of constructions. I would also add, I would also add that the UAE was the principal corridor for which Iran, through which Iran managed to evade the sanctions pretty harsh at times imposed on it by the US. So it's not the first and it wouldn't be the last time. Exactly. So we know that UAE has a history of operating as a intermediary when there are Western sanctions imposed and when there are restrictions. So if we see you know, emerging mining sector in Afghanistan and other economic developments as an opportunity for foreign investors to, you know, enter the Afghan market. I see a potential because if UAE, Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Iran and China are all part of one economic organization, whenever they want to expand or invest in any other country, this alliance will naturally have some impact on development in those parts of the world. And it will also bypass sanctions and restrictions and embargoes because we see from the way they deal with one another and the way they operate that they are more or less indifferent to any kind of moral or legal objections that the West has. So would you say that is there a possibility of significant changes or are you more skeptical towards those developments? Like I said, I think the UAE has its own motivations in having reservations about the Taliban. I don't believe that it's an instance where some countries are Western puppets and they blindly and unquestioningly adopt Western motives as their own. I think they have their, just as I said, just as I said with regard to Pakistan as well, the, the, the issue or the points of difference and contention cannot just be extrapolated out toward the blocks to which these different countries may or may not belong. They're far more immediate and thus the role of the UAE in helping Afghanistan evade certain sanctions is one that the UAE would do on the basis of its own interests, as it has done with Iran in the past, and in which those interests would potentially be financial, moral uh, reservations notwithstanding. All right. Let's just uh, focus on the declaration at the end of this Kazan summit 
of bricks. Uh, there, the section mentioning Afghanistan starts with, we emphasize the need for an urgent, peaceful settlement in Afghanistan in order to strengthen regional security and stability. Whenever a settlement is mentioned, what do they mean by settlement? A, what needs to be settled? Is an arra arrangement in which all parties and can be satisfied. Would you say that the member states of BRICS see all parties, in other words, other parties, as equally powerful and significant in the Afghan political arena? Not probably not as powerful, but significant to have incorporated within this peaceful settlement. Yes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be calling for the settlement. OK, so and if peaceful, if peaceful, if a peaceful settlement is being emphasized, it means that not only is the settlement absent, but the peace is also absent. You see, there's an yes. absent that so the two it's, reinforce it's... each other. It, it does imply that there is no peace in Afghanistan. And it also implies that there is no consensus, no uh, settlement. Which... Exactly. And if you remember when I mentioned earlier, the Putin's declaration at the end of the conference talking about the lack of imposition of any sort of political conditions, while it's being... You know, it's being contradicted here in this declaration. I mean, this is, and this is the thing, this is whether or not you believe that this declaration is good or bad. The reality is, is that there are conditions being imposed because if BRICS and the, the summit in Kazan were purely about money, it's just business, it's nothing personal, then we wouldn't be extending ourselves into the realm of the political very good point okay so in the next sentence they say we advocate for afghanistan as an independent united and peaceful state free from terrorism war and drugs so well, while yeah. they are saying that they want to they don't want to impose any values or anything they do state very clearly that they have their ideas about what Afghanistan needs to look like. But I would say that the emphasis on security, stability, terrorism, war, and drugs does reveal that BRICS as an alliance has a very negative and skeptical perception towards Afghanistan. How would you assess that? I would I would agree with that entirely because this is you know to play devil's advocate one could say how can you have an economic alliance how can you have an economic block if in the center of that block is a non-peaceful country that is a haven for war terrorism and drugs right but you can say many things about Afghanistan one thing that is absolutely certain is an absence of conflict at the moment and in defining terrorism you are essentially defining legitimate or illegitimate political activity. So there's no way in which any, and this is the, the, the angle through which I'd view it, is not to fault President Putin for being a hypocrite. It's just that there's no way for international relations or politics to, or economic relations indeed to be had without stemming from the political. And as the German philosopher Carl Schmitt says, the state is an extension of the political and the political is not an extension of the state because Aristotle believed that man is a political and everything stems from the political. So there's no way, despite all of the pretensions otherwise and all of the declarations otherwise, consciously or unconsciously, eventually, we are going to get into the realm of politics and differing systems of values and imposing one set of values on the other. Because if we if we really sort of, you know, the meme about, you know, smoking weed and then going really deep into thought mode, who do, based on which value system do we decide that drugs are bad or good? There are always values involved. I mean, Russia is known as a country where people tend to drink quite a lot. 
So yes. the fact that they have a problem with drugs, but not alcohol, it Which reveals is that they're taking definition. an ideological and yes. Exactly. Okay. The next sentence, we urge for more visible and verifiable measures in Afghanistan to ensure that the territory of Afghanistan, yes, is not is used, not by, used by, terrorists. by terrorists. What do they mean by visible and verifiable measures? It sounds a lot like conditions once placed on Saddam Hussein to have sites in his country inspected. So who would be doing the inspecting in Afghanistan on behalf and of BRICS? And based on which criteria? And who would be defined as terrorists? Because the thing here, Sanger, is that if you look at these previous declarations and summits, trilateral, the smaller ones that have been held, some of these organizations have been named. Over here, we're not seeing any names. So it looks like carte blanche to, you know, to, to keep your cards close to your chair. That there's no definition of who or what the terrorist is. One could even say even the Taliban recently were classified as a terrorist organization by Russia. Why this summit was held and why the Taliban are now attending. Yes, very interesting. And this reinforces the idea that BRICS is not very keen on accepting and embracing Afghanistan. Basically, they are saying Afghanistan is not safe. It's filled with all kinds of terrorist organizations. And there Correct. is no way for us to, you know, have any kind of assurance and guarantee that uh, a threat may emerge out of Afghanistan to... So, all right. The next sentence. We stress the need to provide urgent, uninterrupted humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people and to safeguard the fundamental rights of all Afghans, including women, girls and different ethnic groups well what is implied here is that the fundamental rights of all afghans including women girls and different ethnic groups are currently not being safeguarded and in that regard there's given once again that this conference was hosted in russia uh, it echoes the previous statements that have been made by russia's special envoy to afghanistan zamir kabalov who's spoken quite at length on the ethnicity issue and alleging sort of different things with regard to Afghanistan's ethno-demographic makeup. But over here as well, we also have BRICS taking a firm stance on gender equality or the lack of it, which once again seems to belie President Putin's declaration as to the, the lack of a political facet to BRICS and really and truly sort of opens up questions given that Russia tends to market itself in the West as a protector of traditional values, those traditional Christian values, if you will, also have a marked lack of what is today defined as gender equality. So really, we're, there's a lot here to be asked, a lot to be interrogated, but not much that's being answered in any meaningful way. But the first section of this urge refer to Uninterrupted humanitarian assistance. Does this mean that humanitarian assistance is interrupted by the Taliban or by other actors? The current sanctions and restrictions imposed by the West wow. are interrupting. So I would say okay. this sentence could be interpreted in two different ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah. But anyways, but the next sentence becomes even more explicit. We call on Afghanistan authorities to reverse the effective ban on girls' secondary and higher education. Now, I think you said enough about this being a very political statement and very ideological, but it also reveals that they do care about how a country is governed. And they do care about the sensitive political matters. So, for example, one of the matters that is often mentioned by a lot of proponents of BRICS and people who are glorifying Russia and Putin and China, a typical tankist, what they're basically saying is that 
the liberal Western world order is very dogmatic, ideological, and it's very moralistic. It interferes in internal matters of other countries. But at the same time, they claim that Russia does no such thing or that China is not interested in imposing its values and its morality on other countries. All they want to do is just economic and, you know, bilateral relations. But here we see the BRICS declaration being more or less identical to statements by Western politicians. This could have easily been a statement by someone from United States, United Kingdom, or even the Netherlands. So with that regards, we can basically conclude that the statement is very similar to anything that would come from any other organizations such as the European Union uh, or maybe NATO. Would you have anything to say about that? I, I'd agree 100%, but I would conclude as well and, and say that the Taliban's attendance at this conference is still a win for them insofar as once again the growing acceptability of their image international fora is ultimately the the main thing that they will take away from this the fact that they are attending conferences in which not just iranian and indian politicians are attending but chinese and russian once again at this moment in time, it's about taking what you can and any sort of normalization and any sort of these international fora will work. And also, it will, there'll be a feeling that perhaps this could prompt or it could provoke something of a change in the attitude of Western policymakers and whichever capitals to engage with Afghanistan in earnest to prevent it from going toward the other camp. Not, not to say, I think in Western capitals, it will be very clearly known that the Taliban do not want to join one political or security bloc over another, but they would want to sort of preempt any further overtures toward Afghanistan from BRICS and an anti-Western bloc with any sort with some sort of overture or interaction from the Western side. So that will be the main and the key takeaways as far as the Taliban are concerned. So despite the fact that there's been a joint declaration once again criticizing some of the domestic politics and the policies in Afghanistan. And despite the fact that Afghanistan is still not a member state, what the Taliban will take from this is essentially the the pictures of the event and the fact that they are increasingly becoming mainstream. And that ultimately will be their main takeaway at this moment. The final and last sentence of the declaration where they mention Afghanistan, they say, we emphasize the primary and effective role of regional platforms and neighboring countries of Afghanistan and welcome the efforts of such regional platforms and initiatives to facilitate the Afghan settlements. How would you interpret this? I would say that this reinforces what one of our one of our previous guests, Dr. Abdul Hay Khanet, said, which is that the rug. I'm paraphrasing. He said the rug is being pulled out from under the West's feet, and the West is no longer in the driver's seat in terms of creating policy toward Afghanistan. The West is now an actor, but it is not the actor. Others. The, the consensus on Afghanistan is shifting east. Whether that consensus is good or not is a separate topic. But the emphasis here, and once again, it goes back to the point that I made with regard to the growing acceptability of the Taliban and the fact that the Taliban will want this to prompt Western policymakers to engage back with the Taliban in earnest, is the fact that regional platforms and neighboring countries are being emphasized as the primary movers and shakers as far as Afghanistan goes. So not the fact that they are one of the stakeholders, but the stakeholder. And I think that is what the Taliban, it's almost like a jealous ex-girlfriend kind of situation here. So All right, thank you for that. So in conclusion, we could say that the BRICS summit 
is a positive development maybe for regional economic cooperation, but we still have to be very skeptical because this particular statement does not really suggest what some commentators have been implying. Uh, we saw a lot of people, especially in Afghanistan, being very optimistic, saying, well, uh, now that world is moving towards multipolarity, uh, we will get rid of this Western urge and desire to impose its values and its ideology through institutions such as IMF, World Bank, the United Nations, the, all their NGOs, etc. And that the emerging powers such as China, Russia, and maybe even India and Iran will be less ideological and they will just focus on economic growth and prosperity and development. Based on what we have discussed here, I would say that that's a very naive understanding of what's going on. Would you what I would say though yes. what I would say is that what it's definitely not a negative development as far as Afghanistan's government is concerned a mildly positive one perhaps but nowhere near the jingoistically positive that we've been hearing coming out of Afghanistan because in Pashto we have a saying Sangar which is yatim pajara morde the orphan is satiated by crying as in his situation cannot get much worse and he's made his peace with crying so even this declaration which was markedly political and betrayed all the signs of political interference that we would otherwise associate with the west there's nothing new there's been no escalation in the negative coverage of afghanistan oh it's just another country talking about women and girls in afghanistan big deal it's another day in the office as far as the Taliban are concerned. The positives are the fact, honestly, the positives are the fact that the Taliban got an invite to an international summit, an international summit for a bloc that has accepted new members and in which they managed to take some pictures and in which Afghanistan's independence was underlined, its, its unity was underscored and so on and so forth. As for the negatives... Oh, well, you know, yeah, the women and the girls stuff, we've heard it before and no doubt we'll hear it again. That is ultimately what the rationale will be in Kabul. So as far as Kabul is concerned, a positive development, mildly positive, nowhere near as transformative as some Afghan political commentators have been declaring it to be. All right. Thank you very much. And on that note, I would like to wrap up this episode to our dear listeners and viewers, thank you for joining us and uh, we hope to see you in our next episode. If you like our content and if you appreciate what we do here at Afghan Eye, please make sure to visit our Patreon page and our PayPal page. Uh, if you want to become a regular contributor, you can become one via patreon if you want to do a one-off donation you can visit our paypal page and if you would like to be active and involved maybe you would like to write for the afghan eye if you have an article that you would like us to publish please send us an email our email address is info at afghan .org. and until our next episode Take care of yourself and each other. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wassalam.